Tired of the same old King Arthur stories? Why read novels about King Arthur when you already know what happens in them? We all know the tale, right? Wrong. Over the past year, I've read, or in many cases reread, dozens of retellings of the Arthurian saga. A few have their roots in the traditional tale penned by Thomas Mallory 600 years ago, but most are modern retellings that go to significant lengths to distance themselves from Mallory, approaching the tale from very different directions and focusing on characters, events, and themes from often obscure parts of Celtic, Saxon, Norman, and even Nordic folklore and mythology. They aren't what you might expect from a King Arthur story. To help you navigate the many options available, I'll share what I consider to be some of the most memorable and enjoyable versions of the story. Welcome to the Library Ladder. As I discussed in my previous video, what most people today think of as the Arthur story is just one of a great many variations created for different purposes over the course of more than a thousand years. Ironically, Arthur's not even the main character in most of them. For most people, King Arthur probably calls to mind a young boy being tutored by the wizard Merlin, pulling a sword from a stone or an anvil to become king, creating the Knights of the Round Table, being part of a doomed love triangle with Guinevere and Lancelot, and fathering a son with his half-sister precipitating his downfall. That's the best-known version of the story, popularized in the 1400s by Mallory in his epic narrative Le Mort d'Arthur, and elaborated upon in later centuries by many others, from Mark Twain to Walt Disney to the Broadway team of Lerner and Lowe. But that's not the best place to start, in my opinion. Versions based on Mallory might seem a little stale or trite to readers today. Instead, there are some distinctive modern retellings that make great starting points. I think they're much fresher and more likely to whet your appetite for additional variations on Arthur's Tale. I'll discuss my specific book recommendations in a few minutes, but as a general rule of thumb, I suggest approaching the modern retellings roughly in order of publication. There are some terrific versions written in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s that make great entry points and serve as helpful guideposts for reading some of the more recent retellings. There also are some excellent versions from more recent decades, but I found that I appreciated those versions more when I could recognize the efforts those authors made to differentiate their approaches from what had come before. For the most part, I didn't get tired of reading the various modern versions of the story. I enjoyed experiencing the vibrant and constantly evolving nature of the Arthur saga from one author to the next, with different events and characters and outcomes taking center stage in various retellings. Arthur could be a hero, a villain, a fool, or an NPC, depending on the author's vision of the story, and the same goes for the rest of the characters. The other general advice I'd offer for where to start is to follow your preference for either fantastical or historical retellings. Among the modern versions, there are both kinds and a fair amount of blending of the two approaches. The differences between older, traditional versions and modern retellings extend far beyond the story's plot and the sometimes archaic prose. The narrative structure, world building, and character development are also substantially different. Traditional versions based on Mallory and its precursors tend to have episodic structures. Most are basically compilations of short adventures and folk tales with limited degrees of connectedness. They often have the length of a novel, but not the narrative continuity. Similarly, the world-building in traditional versions tends to be very sparse, supplying just enough information to provide context, but not nearly enough to feel immersive. Along those lines, political intrigue and cultural and religious conflicts are more detailed and play far larger roles in modern retellings. Likewise, the characters in older tellings tend to lack depth. As readers, we know what they do, but we know far less about how they think or feel. And those storytelling shortcomings make sense in the context of the original purposes of the Arthur tales as political, religious, and cultural propaganda. They were basically morality tales and hagiographies intended to teach lessons and instill pride in relatively unsophisticated readers and listeners. In contrast, modern retellings read like actual novels, with much tighter and more cohesive storylines, far more developed and immersive world-building, and characters it's possible to really identify with and feel empathy for. 
And as I mentioned before, the modern ones also explore more widely other pre-Mallory traditions from Welsh, French, German, and other sources. This can get a little confusing at times, because many of the major characters and places have completely different names from one book to the next, depending on the cultural tradition that serves as the source material. The Welsh ones, in particular, tend to deviate the most, but that variation also helps the stories avoid feeling stale. Similarly, the relationships between characters can differ significantly. For example, in some retellings, Arthur and Merlin are closely related, with Merlin even a potential heir to the throne, while in others, Merlin is no relation at all. Likewise, Morgaine and Morgaze can be separate characters in some versions, and a single composite character in others. And Morgaine, or Morgan Le Fay, can be presented as good, as evil, or as somewhere in between, depending on the author's preferences. In the older retellings, the narrative point of view typically is detached from the story itself. They're not told from the perspective of a particular character. Instead, they tend to read more like stories compiled and recounted by bards long after the fact. In contrast, modern versions humanize their stories more by centering their narratives around specific characters. Sometimes they're structured as memoirs or reminiscences told from a first-person point of view, and other times as limited-perspective third-person POVs. For those reasons, and others, I strongly encourage prioritizing Arthurian novels written in the last 60 years or so. King Arthur's continued presence in the public consciousness, despite the enormous changes in society and popular culture over the past 150 years, owes much to the efforts of children's authors who repopularized the legends among kids in the late 1800s and have continued to produce new variations ever since. Their works have primed new generations of readers to appreciate Arthur's story and many of the archetypes it contains. From the straightforward Mallory adaptations by Sidney Lanier, Howard Pyle, Roger Lancelin Green, and others, to the Prince Valiant comic strip that was at its peak in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, to the acclaimed fantasy works of Alan Garner, Andre Norton, and Susan Cooper that incorporate Arthurian mythology, to more recent adaptations by Nancy Springer, Meg Cabot, DJ McHale, and T.A. Barron. Even Mary Pope Osborne's Magic Treehouse series for early readers has a connection to Arthur through the treehouse's proprietor, Morgan Le Fay. And in the past decade, several manga adaptations have appeared and made new fans of Arthur around the world. Similarly, there's been a proliferation of what I'll call Arthur-adjacent stories written for adults. In some respects, they might be considered the literary equivalent of fan fiction, in which authors borrow parts of Arthurian mythology to tell stories entirely of their own. And it's not just a recent phenomenon. Edmund Spencer's epic 16th century poem, The Fairy Queen, features King Arthur in a recurring role as a catalyst who helps resolve different situations involving the poem's main characters. Then the medieval tale of Gawain and the Green Knight is one of many other older works that feature Arthur in minor supporting roles. There also are works that have more limited connections to Arthuriana. Some of Robert E. Howard's sword and sorcery tales draw from the same Celtic histories and mythologies that gave rise to King Arthur. And the same is true for Jack Vance's wonderful Leoness trilogy and Gene Wolfe's Castle View. There are even Arthur legends and imagery embedded in science fiction, from C.S. Lewis's influential space trilogy to Arthur Landis's far less influential medieval space opera set on a planet named Camelot. The 1970s were a wellspring of additional Arthur-adjacent stories, including some by Richard Monaco, H. Warner Munn, and Andre Norton, as the fantasy genre gained popularity and as authors and publishers turned to familiar characters and legends in an effort to quickly meet the growing demand. Those aren't some of the best Arthur stories, in my opinion. In more recent decades, King Arthur has played instrumental roles in a variety of high fantasies, urban fantasies, horror fantasies, and literary fantasies by authors such as Guy Gavriel Kay, Tim Powers, Stephen King, Kazuo Ishiguro, and Nicola Griffith. I'll note that, despite my high regard for those works and authors, they aren't included in this video's list of recommended Arthur retellings. I don't think they're sufficiently Arthur-focused. Before I get to my recommendations, let me highlight a few of the works that 
didn't make the cut. Some involve time travel. Others are tales of swords and sorcery. Some strive for a more historical feel, while others approach Arthur's story from a female perspective. And there are several traditional versions that, while high in historical literary significance, might not be the most enjoyable to read due to their weak narrative structure and often archaic prose. I'll also award a couple of honorable mentions to authors Gillian Bradshaw and Sean Pogue, who've written two very enjoyable series of Arthurian novels. Alas, they just didn't fit on my final list. So let's move on to my recommendations. I'll start with five traditional retellings that drew inspiration from Mallory. Please note, I'm not recommending that you start your reading journey here. As I said earlier, I think some of the modern adaptations are much better entry points, but these five are some of the most readable and influential versions of the traditional, widely known story of Arthur. The first one isn't a novel at all. Instead, it's the epic poem by Alfred, Lord Tennyson, that contributed to the Romantic-era revival of King Arthur's popularity in the 1800s. I first read Idols of the King when I was about 22 or 23, and I can still remember impulse buying a paperback copy of it in the Crown Books around the corner from where I worked. I think I had recently watched the movie Excalibur, or maybe it was the musical Camelot, and I thought it would be interesting to read some of the traditional source material for those films. I still remember it 35 years later because it was very unusual for me. I've never really been much of a poetry reader. Sure, I read the poetry that was assigned in my English literature classes in high school and college, but I didn't actively seek it out. Idols of the King was a rare exception. I read it over the course of a week while commuting to and from work, and to say I was shocked by how much I enjoyed it would be an understatement. I found it captivating in a way I didn't expect. By presenting the story in verse, Tennyson masked some of its familiarity, making it seem new and different, while also mitigating somewhat the disjointed and episodic structure of its folklore roots in Mallory and the Mabinogion. For those interested in trying fantasy with a very different kind of narrative structure, I highly recommend Idols of the King. And if you can find an edition containing the original woodcut illustrations by Gustave Doré, all the better. Pivoting away from poetry, of the many attempts over the centuries to translate Mallory's 15th century prose for contemporary readers, two stand out for me. The first is Howard Pyle's four-volume retelling of the saga, published between 1903 and 1910, comprising The Story of King Arthur and His Knights, The Story of the Champions of the Round Table, the story of Sir Launcelot and his companions, and the story of the Grail and the passing of Arthur. Pyle's interpretation of Mallory's story borrows heavily from Tennyson and other 19th century authors, such as James Knowles and Sidney Lanier, who adapted Mallory for their own versions. But Pyle's writing elaborates on the story, providing additional background context and character development, and even adding new exploits and adventures to the tale. He also profusely illustrated the books with his own distinctive pen and ink drawings. Keep in mind, though, that Pyle wrote it primarily for adolescent boys, so the story he tells is heavy on smiting and light on smooching. About 50 years later, author John Steinbeck tried his hand at a faithful translation of Mallory into modern prose, and the results are remarkable. Steinbeck had a lifelong love of the Arthurian legends, but he thought the traditional narratives, including Mallory's, were too impersonal and lacked insight into the character's thoughts, feelings, and motivations. Steinbeck's retelling humanizes Mallory's story, giving relationships and conflicts more weight, and imbuing the episodic quests that comprise much of the story with deeper significance as a kind of meta-commentary on the nature of chivalry. It's one of the most sympathetic portrayals of the relationship between Lancelot and Guinevere I've read, but unfortunately, it's marred by the fact that Steinbeck left the story unfinished, never reaching its conclusion with the final confrontation and passing of Arthur. Steinbeck spent three years in the late 1950s writing the Acts of King Arthur and his Noble Knights, and in letters he penned at that time, he expressed hope it would be his magnum opus. But in 1959, he set it aside, unfinished, and never returned to it. The unedited text of his incomplete draft was eventually published posthumously in 1976. And what a draft it is. 
In it, Steinbeck anticipated the narrative depth found in some of the modern, non-Mallory-inspired retellings that began to appear in the 1960s and 70s. I'll note, though, that by remaining faithful to Mallory, the Pyle and Steinbeck versions still suffer from some of the shortcomings of their source material, particularly the disjointed narrative structure that feels more like a series of loosely connected short stories, or folk tales, which is basically what Mallory's original version was. The final two traditional Mallory retellings I recommend are also very untraditional in their own ways. The first is Mark Twain's 1889 novel, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Although it borrows significantly from Mallory's basic plot and characters, this isn't a serious retelling of the Arthurian legend. It's one of the earliest time travel novels in which an American engineer named Hank from the late 19th century finds himself suddenly transported to the medieval court of King Arthur, where he uses his knowledge of science and industry to establish himself as one of Arthur's closest advisors. Hank is both an idealist and an opportunist. He reacts to the cultural, economic, and judicial injustices of the Middle Ages with a mix of moral shock and a determination to modernize that era through industrialization, fair wages, and enforceable legal contracts, among other things. He even convinces the Knights of the Round Table to give up their war horses and ride bicycles instead. Hank's rise to power as the self-styled boss of England isn't without its costs, though, as he makes mortal enemies out of Merlin, who he discredits as a charlatan, and the Catholic Church. Both resent their loss of influence over Arthur and plot to reverse the radical changes Hank introduces. It's a fun story, and in typical Twain style, it's full of pithy asides and acerbic commentary to the reader that make it apparent that Twain was doing more than just trying to entertain. Twain projects many of his own complaints about modern society onto medieval Britain and uses Hank as his mouthpiece to critique a wide range of topics, including the monarchy, the aristocracy, religion, slavery, chivalry, warfare, taxes, politics, and industrialization. Sometimes his critiques miss the mark or betray a little too much cynicism for an otherwise lighthearted story, but I think most add a different and welcome kind of humor to the mix. And if you can find one, I recommend reading an edition containing the original pen and ink illustrations by Dan Beard that add another layer of comedy to the story. Beard was most famous as one of the founders of the Boy Scouts of America in the early 1900s, but he also was a very accomplished author and illustrator in the decades before then. My final recommendation based on the traditional Arthur tale is T.H. White's series, The Once and Future King, comprising four novels published during his lifetime and a fifth published posthumously. Arguably, this is the retelling that has had the greatest influence on popular perceptions and understanding of the Arthur saga today. There actually are two somewhat different versions of the novels. White published an initial trilogy, The Sword and the Stone, The Witch in the Wood, and The Ill-Made Knight, between 1938 and 1940. After 1940, White continued to work on additional volumes for the series while also revising the original trilogy. This led to the publication in 1958 of an updated omnibus edition, The Once and Future King, that made modest changes to The Sword in the Stone and The Ill-Made Knight, replaced The Witch in the Wood with an almost completely rewritten version retitled The Queen of Air and Darkness, and added a concluding fourth novel, The Candle in the Wind. A fifth novel, The Book of Merlin, published in 1977 after White's death, provides an extended version of Merlin's tutelage of Arthur, much of which is also covered in The Sword and the Stone. The Book of Merlin is included in some later omnibus editions of The Once and Future King, but don't worry if your edition doesn't include it. I don't think it's essential to the story. The first novel, The Sword and the Stone, recounts the story of Arthur's childhood, expanding on Mallory's version and putting the magical elements on full display. Merlin the Magician becomes the catalyst for nearly everything that happens as he mentors young Arthur and teaches him useful lessons to help him become a responsible adult and a wise king. But White adds twists to the story mainly involving magical lessons and animal transformations that give a lighthearted feel to the political lessons being imparted. The idea that Merlin ages backwards in time originated here to witty effect. 
and it served as the inspiration for the 1963 Walt Disney animated film with the same name. The tone shifts substantially in the subsequent books, though, as White introduces and later multiplies the tragic aspects of Arthur's tale. Book two focuses on Arthur's half-sister, Morgaze, the queen of the Orkney Isles, and her less-than-ideal senses of motherhood and fidelity to her husband, King Lot. It features King Pelinor and his somewhat absurd search for the mythical questing beast, and Arthur reaches an age when he can indulge his desire to lead warriors in battle. Book three shifts the focus again, this time to Lancelot, the ill-made knight of the title. Here, the author subverts the traditional portrayal of Lancelot by making him repulsively ugly in appearance, which feeds the knight's obsessive desire to seek perfection in other aspects of his life. This isn't a happy book, as Lancelot's self-loathing and Guinevere's loneliness drive much of the plot. And the outlook gets even more dour in Book 4, which returns the focus to Arthur, brooding over his now-tattered hopes and dreams. I'll note that the Broadway musical Camelot was inspired in large part by Books 3 and 4, although with substantial levity added by its songs. On the whole, the Once and Future King has some bite to it. The knights featured in the books are often petty and insecure, which adds realistic touches to their characters. But it also illustrates the insurmountable difficulty Arthur faces in trying to instill chivalric, religious, and jurisprudential ideals in them. Curiously, and somewhat frustratingly for me, White seemed to revel in the many flaws of the knights, rather than in their virtues. You might have guessed by now that, although I really enjoy the sword and the stone, I'm less enthusiastic about the rest of the Once and Future King. The books are beautifully written, but the optimism of the first book gradually gives way to pessimism, futility, and, by the end of Arthur's story, even hints of nihilism. As tragedies go, this one's pretty bleak. And that's true of both the original and revised versions, although more so in the revised texts. Of the two versions, I prefer the originals. Unfortunately, it's hard to find editions containing the original text these days. The darker, revised version seems to mirror changes in White's own perspective following World War II, as he became more disillusioned and pessimistic about war and power and love, suggesting that, contrary to Merlin's teachings in the first book, might does in fact make right. Nevertheless, despite my own lack of enthusiasm for parts of it, I do consider this one of the essential Arthurian retellings that's well worth reading. There are ten modern retellings included in this list. Most of them are multi-volume series that require extra commitment from readers, but a few can be read as standalone novels. Many of them draw inspiration from Welsh, French, and Nordic Arthurian legends that Mallory ignored, which makes them feel fresher today. Although some of them can be thought of as fantasy novels, most have more in common with historical fiction. And even the fantasy retellings aim for some degree of historical plausibility. Arthurian novels have proliferated wildly in recent years. In terms of sheer volume, most are self-published and many fall into the YA and romanticy categories. I haven't read very many of those, so they aren't included in this list of recommended books. And as I go through the list, I'll arrange them into tiers, separating the truly essential reads from those I consider just very rewarding. There are four memorable retellings I've classified as fantasy. I'll discuss them in publication order. The first happens to be one of the very best. It's my favorite Arthurian series above all others. Mary Stewart's Merlin Trilogy, composed of 1970's The Crystal Cave, 1973's The Hollow Hills, and 1979's The Last Enchantment. These books were a substantial departure from the romantic suspense novels Stewart was famous for in the 1950s and 60s, including one that, bizarrely, was adapted into a Disney movie. This trilogy tells Arthur's story from the perspective of Merlin. The Crystal Cave traces Merlin's early years from boyhood as he grapples with his disreputable status as the illegitimate son of a princess of South Wales who secludes herself in a nunnery and tells people the devil impregnated her rather than reveal the true identity of Merlin's father. This, along with the ability of second sight he was born with, makes Merlin both special and feared. The first novel follows his maturation, guided by a variety of teachers into the arts of illusion, engineering, warfare, and politics, 
and culminating with his pivotal role in the birth of Arthur. The second book, The Hollow Hills, finds Merlin at the peak of his powers, attempting to make real a prophetic vision he has of Arthur's eventual kingship by searching for the fabled sword Caliburn and by protecting adolescent Arthur from those who would do him harm, while also teaching him about the wider world and the finer points of leadership. The final book, The Last Enchantment, features an older, somewhat diminished Merlin, who struggles to guide and protect the now King Arthur and his vision of Camelot from the ambitions and vengeance of rivals. He's more spymaster than wizard at this point, spending much of his time traveling incognito, gathering intelligence, and attempting to manipulate events in Britain. He also takes on an apprentice with momentous results. This is a fantasy series, but it feels historical. Stuart grounds her story in the post-Roman era of Britain and includes a plausible depiction of the Roman warrior cult of Mithras. There's far more mysticism than magic, which stays mostly in the background. There's also strong emphasis on court intrigue and the politics of making a kingdom, on fulfilling prophecies rather than depicting battles, and on the complicated relationships between characters. The story owes more to Geoffrey of Monmouth and Welsh folktales than to Mallory's version of the saga, and Merlin makes a compelling and sympathetic protagonist in Stuart's telling. This trilogy is sometimes criticized for its lack of a primary antagonist and for its scant representation and development of female characters. I don't see those as flaws, though. Instead, I think they enhance the realism of the narrative. Britain in the early Middle Ages was chaotic, with many petty kings and warlords striving among themselves for supremacy, with allegiances that shifted frequently. It makes historical sense that Merlin, and later Arthur, would confront a series of opportunistic and ruthless villains and villainesses instead of a single big bad. Likewise, the relative lack of central female characters makes sense to me in the context of the story's narrator. For much of the story, Merlin lives a monastic lifestyle, secluded and with very little contact with women. He doesn't understand them, and is even a little afraid of them. It's little wonder that his first-person POV narrative doesn't spend much time pondering female perspectives. Please, read this trilogy. It's absolutely one of the essentials. Stewart wrote two more novels, 1983's The Wicked Day and 1995's The Prince and the Pilgrim, that extend the story. But, alas, not from Merlin's perspective. The Wicked Day concludes Arthur's story with the events leading up to his final confrontation with his illegitimate son Mordred. What makes this novel distinctive is its remarkably sympathetic portrayal of Mordred. The Prince and the Pilgrim is little more than a side story set during the time of the third book that focuses on completely new characters. I like both novels somewhat less than the Merlin trilogy, and I don't think they're essential. My next recommended title is by another female author, one who took the opposite approach of Mary Stewart and centered her version on the women in Arthur's story. Marion Zimmer Bradley's The Mists of Avalon, published in 1982, is sometimes hailed, or derided, as a feminist take on the Arthur saga. I don't agree with that label. I think that's a lazy and simplistic description of a much more complex and nuanced novel. It pigeonholes the novel, limiting recognition of Bradley's accomplishment and potentially steering some readers away from it who might otherwise discover they really enjoy it. The feminist label seems to have been a reaction in the early 1980s to Bradley's decision to tell the story from the perspective of female characters such as Igraine, Morgaine, Guinevere, Vivian, and Morghese. Every other Arthurian retelling of note up to that time had been told from the perspective of male characters, but no one was labeling them masculinist. Calling the Mists of Avalon feminist suggests a double standard and does a disservice to the author and the novel. And if there's any ideology inherent in the novel, it's found in the echoes of the author's belief in New Age spiritualism, not radical or militant feminism, as some critics have suggested. This is a book I'd been meaning to read for decades, but hadn't. I finally got around to it, and I'm very glad I did. It's a well-crafted novel with believable plot development and carefully drawn characters who exhibit plausible motivations for their actions. It's not a good versus evil kind of story. The characters are nuanced, with some behaving badly for reasons they believe to be good.
Thus, it's a different kind of morality tale, one that contrasts the moral, however defined, with the amoral. It also balances much of the narrative's conflict on the tension between fate and free will. Morgaine, a Celtic priestess of Avalon and half-sister to Arthur, is a central figure caught between prophecies and the knowledge that their truth depends on her own actions and manipulations of others. It's a story grounded in early Celtic folklore. Magic is real in the story, but it's limited to druids and priestesses of Avalon. A major theme is the encroachment of Christianity into traditional pagan culture and beliefs, and Bradley attempts to reconcile those competing religions as two sides of the same coin, each fanatical and sometimes grotesque in ways that complement the other. It's a very long novel, heavily character-driven. To the extent there are battles, they occur mostly off-screen. Different sections are told from the perspective of various characters, and those POV shifts can be a little jarring, particularly when it sometimes shifts from third-person narration to first-person for more gain. How characters are related to each other can be confusing as well, if you're familiar with traditional versions of Arthur's tale. Bradley departs from many of the well-known conventions. For example, Merlin isn't a character's name at all. Rather, it's a title bestowed upon a chief druid. And Igraine, Vivian, and Morgaze are sisters fathered by Taliesin, who becomes Arthur's grandfather in this telling. This is another essential read, not only for the quality of its story, but also for the influence it's had on the fantasy genre as a whole over the past 40 years. I'll also note that my endorsement of this book is completely disconnected from my opinion about the author herself. I try to keep my opinions about art and artist separate, unsavory as the artist's behavior might be. So please, don't post comments below criticizing Bradley as a person. I consider such comments irrelevant to the discussion of her novel. This isn't the forum for dissecting the author's sins. Moving on to my third recommended Arthurian retelling with a fantasy bent. It's Stephen R. Lawhead's five-volume Pendragon Cycle, published between 1987 and 1997, starting with Taliesin and continuing with Merlin, Arthur, Pendragon, and Grail. This one takes more liberties with the basic story. It's as if various elements of Welsh, Roman, and other traditions were tossed into a blender and given a Christian veneer. Imagine, if you will. A story about the survivors of the fall of Atlantis finding refuge on the shores of Britain and establishing a technologically advanced and fabled society that's viewed with a mix of suspicion and covetousness by its Celtic neighbors. It's a multi-generational tale that, over the course of the first two books, traces Merlin's origin as the son of an Atlantean princess, who is also an accomplished gladiatrix, and a Celtic bard with the voice of an angel. Literally. By the third book, the narrative shifts to Arthur and Merlin's efforts to assist him. Like Mary Stewart's Merlin trilogy, the first three volumes in Lawhead's series were published as a self-contained story. Lawhead later wrote two more volumes to fill in narrative gaps in Arthur's tale. This is a very memorable and creative Arthurian retelling, which is why I recommend it. I have to admit, though, it's not one of my favorites. The story as a whole doesn't feel grounded to me. Many of the characters, relationships, and conflicts don't feel fully developed or plausible to me. Merlin is a central character in the books, but he pales in comparison to Mary Stewart's version of him. Magic is real in the Pendragon Cycle, but it takes the form of divine intervention, literally deus ex machina. That ends up not feeling as profound or consequential as Lahed might have intended. The series is an interesting counterpoint to Bradley's The Mists of Avalon. Both authors attempt to reconcile and harmonize Druidic paganism and Christianity in their stories, but where Bradley clearly prioritized Celtic pagan traditions, Lawhead couches his narrative in overtly Christian themes. On the whole, this is a rewarding series, but for me, it doesn't quite measure up to most of the rest on this list. And the award for the weirdest retelling on this list goes to A.A. A. Atanasio's four-volume Perilous Order of Camelot series, published between 1994 and 1999. This is easily the strangest and most confusing Arthurian tale I've ever read, and yet it's also remarkably captivating. 
I hinted at this one in my previous video. It incorporates many of the standard Arthurian characters, events, and conflicts, but it adds a very unique spin. Events occur in different contexts. Characters have very different origin stories and arcs. For example, Merlin is actually a formerly evil demon, an anti-angel, trapped in a human body. There are complex spiritual and supernatural themes that run throughout it, including the eternal battle between angels and demons, as well as the fate of the Fae. It goes far beyond the traditional Arthurian story while still retaining much of its basic framework. And did I mention it's weird? It's a fever dream mashup of Mallory, Marion Zimmer Bradley, Neil Gaiman's American Gods, John Milton's Paradise Lost, the Irish Ulster Cycle, and the quantum physics musings of Neil deGrasse Tyson, among other things. Natanazio's series is likely to polarize readers. It's fascinating, compelling, and very creative, while at the same time, it's a challenging and confusing read, with the plot's action occasionally taking a back seat to discourses on theology and cosmology. It's also told from a third-person omniscient, present-tense perspective, which is highly unusual and takes some getting used to. So, if you're looking for a retelling that's far off the beaten path and yet still recognizably Arthurian, A.A. Atanasio's The Perilous Order of Camelot series might be for you. It probably won't resonate with most readers, which is why I don't consider it an essential read, but I do think it's rewarding and deserves to be more widely known and appreciated. My remaining six recommended retellings are written in the guise of historical fiction, with any magical or fantastical elements in them kept very limited and ambiguous. I'll discuss them in publication order. The first is a standalone novel that can be credited with inspiring the other five books on this list, as well as Mary Stewart's Merlin trilogy. It's Rosemary Sutcliffe's 1963 novel, Sword at Sunset, which might be thought of as a direct rebuttal aimed at T.H. White's fantastical, anachronistic, and very popular The Once and Future King. Sutcliffe set out to write the most historically accurate, or at least plausible, account of Arthur's story, based on the prevailing scholarship of historians at the time she wrote it. She set the story in the 5th century at the end of the Roman occupation of Britain, discarding all the medieval trappings of earlier retellings, as well as familiar faces such as Merlin and Lancelot. The pomp and pageantry of Camelot is replaced by a grittier, hard-scrabble existence for the people of Britain, who are facing barbarians at the gate from every direction. Saxons, Picts, Scots, and without the Roman legions to protect them. It's up to warrior king Artur the Bear to rally his neighbors and rivals to resist the invaders and to preserve the last vestiges of Rome's civilizing influence. There are battles and political intrigue and memorable scenes of the close bonds Artur forms with those around him. And that simple story synopsis essentially describes the rest of the books to be discussed in this video. Sutcliffe's Sword at Sunset provided the template for them, and a very good one at that. It's also one of the few retellings in which Arthur is the primary point-of-view character. And as a bit of trivia, Sword at Sunset is actually a sequel to three children's novels Sutcliffe wrote in the 1950s, set in Britain during the Roman occupation, including The Eagle of the Ninth and The Lantern Bearers, which won the 1959 Carnegie Medal for the best British children's book of the year. However, Despite picking up the narrative right where the Lantern Bearers leaves off, Sutcliffe wrote Sword at Sunset expressly for adults, not children, which becomes readily apparent early on in the form of an incestuous encounter between Artur and his half-sister Egerna. This book is one of the essentials, not just because of its profound influence on later authors, but also because it's a compelling read. It's not my favorite, but it's very good. And speaking of favorites, if Mary Stewart's trilogy is my favorite Arthurian series, this next book is my favorite standalone. Park Godwin's 1980 novel Fire Lord is tremendous and a criminally forgotten masterpiece in my opinion. It's amazing how much story Godwin condenses into a single volume. His writing reminds me of Guy Gavriel Kay's. Their styles are very different, but both are very efficient in their plotting and character development. 
They have a keen sense of what's essential to establish believable situations, motivations, and relationships without a lot of narrative padding. As I said a minute or two ago, the basic plot is similar to that of Sordid Sunset, although Fire Lord covers more of Arthur's life, including part of his childhood. It's the character work in Fire Lord that really sets it apart. The people feel real. Their camaraderie, jealousy, confusion, bravado, and resentments feel naturally complex and unforced. It's one of the few retellings that makes Arthur the center of the story, and it's also one of the few that makes it worth it. It presents a clear-eyed picture of the relationship between Arthur and Guinevere, how what makes their partnership successful also drives them apart. Arthur is the charismatic but somewhat impulsive and immature leader of men, while Gwen is the voice of reason and clever strategy whispering in his ear. Together, they complement each other and make a formidable pair. Apart, they struggle to thrive. The novel's more than just a character study, though. It's also a story about the clash of cultures, Christian and pagan, nobles and commoners, and Celtic and Saxon and Pictish and Pradain. If I can find fault in the novel, it's in the plot structure, which is a little disjointed and episodic as it skips forward in time by leaps and bounds throughout Arthur's life. That's a minor quibble, though. Read this book if you can find it. It's one of the essentials. Unfortunately, it's been out of print for decades and isn't even available as an ebook. My hope is that reader interest will spur publishers to bring it back into print. Two of the most famous love stories in literature are part of Arthurian lore. There's the love triangle between Arthur, Guinevere, and Lancelot, and the doomed affair of Tristan and Isolde. Both are popular subjects of romance novels, and yet the best romance-focused retelling I've encountered features a different love story between Arthur and Morgan of Avalon. Published in 1988 by romance novelist Joan Wolfe, The Road to Avalon owes a substantial debt to two books I've already discussed in this video, The Mists of Avalon and Fire Lord. Relationships and plot elements in The Road to Avalon seem influenced by those earlier novels. What distinguishes this one from many other romance novels set in olden days is its attention to historical detail. It strives for accuracy in its setting, in character behaviors, in the political conflicts, avoiding the lazy tropes and head-scratching anachronisms found in many historical bodice rippers. And as bodice rippers go, this one is pretty tame, focused more on the emotional relationships between the characters than on the physical ones. I like this book. It's not an all-time classic, unlike some of the others on this list, but it's a great example of storytelling focused on Arthur as a person, and not just as a warrior, or as a king, or as a symbol for the British people. Wolf does a nice job of humanizing him and the others around him. Moving on, what if King Arthur's grandfathers were Howard Rourke and John Galt from Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, but with additional gladiator skills? You might end up with something like Jack White's Camelot Chronicles, a ten-volume series of historical fiction novels tracing Arthur's story across multiple generations that was published between 1992 and 2018. I'm exaggerating, so please don't let any opinions you might have about Rand or her beliefs, favorable or unfavorable, influence your decision to read or avoid this series. In the first book, The Skystone, White starts a couple of generations before Arthur, as Rome is beginning its withdrawal from Britain. Two senior officers in the Roman legions resign their commissions and settle down to pursue lives of their own in Britain. One becomes a supremely skilled and successful blacksmith, while the other, fearing that Rome's civilizing influence will be forever lost to Britain, establishes a secret colony in the backcountry of Wessex to serve as a haven for the brightest minds and highest skilled craftsmen he can find, protecting them from the dark age of turmoil and violence he believes is coming in the wake of Rome's departure. They team up and together start the process of building Camelot, the series is a utopian fantasy with an overarching storyline of how to build and lose a shining city on a hill. At the same time, it's thoroughly grounded as historical fiction. There are no supernatural elements in these books, not even hints or ambiguities. Everything has a rational explanation, often science-based, from the sword in the stone to the lady in the lake. 
Over the course of the books, Uther and Merlin appear as boyhood friends and adult rivals. Arthur is born and is later adopted and raised by Merlin to become the High King of Britain, a title he struggles to retain. Once the narrative shifts to Arthur around the fifth book, the story contains many traditional plot elements. But White consistently reinvents those elements in creative ways, making the tale feel quite different from most of the others on this list. I do have some criticisms of the series. It's too long, and some of the main characters, particularly in the early books, are a little too Paragon-like for my taste. And despite White's efforts at historical accuracy, the books take some anachronistic liberties, such as occasional dialogue that sounds jarringly modern, philosophical and economic concepts and debates that seem centuries premature, and technological advances that are rapidly compressed in time. White also sprinkles in occasional monologues in which the characters seem to serve as mouthpieces for his own ideology. But unlike Ayn Rand, they're relatively few and far between, and delivered with a light hand. If you agree with them, you can enjoy them with a smile on your face. And if you disagree with them, you can roll your eyes with a smile on your face. I think this series is a very rewarding read, but it's not quite one of my essentials. In contrast, I think Bernard Cornwell's Warlord Chronicles trilogy, published between 1995 and 1999, is the gold standard for Arthurian historical fiction. It's not my favorite. The Mary Stuart and Park Godwin retellings are my favorites, but it's close. Cornwell does a terrific job blending historical accuracy with selective borrowing from the Arthurian traditions of Geoffrey of Monmouth and later French writers. Thematically, it might be the most complex of any of the Arthurian tales I discuss in this video, with significant religious, ideological, and moral conflicts sharing time with frequent martial conflicts. The relationship between Arthur and Merlin is a fraught one. They're allies and antagonists at the same time. Both want to use the other to bring about a unified Britain, but they see very different paths to accomplish it. One as an agent of law, and the other as an agent of chaos. Prophecy plays a very important role throughout the trilogy, and Cornwell does a tremendous job keeping the magical arts of Merlin and others a question mark for the readers. The ability of witches and wizards to divine the future and perform other wondrous acts is accepted and often feared by characters, but the demonstrations of supposed magic that occur in the story all have plausible alternative explanations. Those ambiguous supernatural elements are like the dress a few years ago that seemed like a different color to different people. You can read the Warlord Chronicles as fantasy, or you can read it as historical fiction. I happen to see it as historical fiction. So what's the plot? Well, like many of the other retellings I've discussed, it recounts Arthur's efforts to unify Britain in the face of Saxon and Irish aggression but it's presented through the eyes of a young Saxon slave named Derville, who eventually becomes one of Arthur's most trusted advisors and war leaders over the course of the books. Derville's first-person POV narration helps Cornwell maintain the illusion of supernatural forces at work because descriptions of events are filtered through Derville's eyes. Derville's a bit of a Gary Stu character, a little too perfect in some ways, replacing Lancelot as the court paragon but he's a likable one. And I'll offer a slight word of caution. Many of you might be tempted to read the Warlord Chronicles as your entry point to the Arthurian saga. It's one of the best known and most highly regarded versions, and in my opinion, an absolute essential. I don't think Cornwell's retelling is the best place to start, though. The first book in the trilogy, The Winter King, is a little sluggish at first, and imposes a fairly steep learning curve on readers who aren't already somewhat familiar with early Arthur legends and Britain in the early Middle Ages. Instead, as I mentioned earlier, start with one or more of the earliest modern versions by Mary Stuart, Rosemary Sutcliffe, or Park Godwin. They'll provide you with enough familiarity to quickly engage with later versions such as this one. It's a lot like learning a new vocabulary. My final recommendation is Giles Christian's recent duology, Lancelot and Camelot, published in 2018 and 2020. Reading these books is like reading Bernard Cornwell, Light, 
They're very good, and stylistically very similar to Cornwell, which isn't really surprising, since Christian has cited Cornwell's Warlord Chronicles as the books that inspired him to become a historical fiction writer in the first place. The basic premise of the story, Arthur attempting to unify Britain with the help of close companions and momentous battle scenes, is very similar to Cornwell's. However, Christian's retelling stands out by focusing on Lancelot, presenting him as sympathetic, and conflicted and tragic, but without the self-loathing that T.H. White gave him in The Ill-Made Knight. His loyalty to the king and his love for Guinevere are pure and deep, unlike Cornwell's version of him. The story takes substantial liberties with Arthurian canon, including the origins of both Lancelot and Guinevere, and how they first meet and fall in love as children, before either of them has encountered Arthur. This plot twist made the story feel fresher, but I also couldn't help feeling a little manipulated by the author, as if he was forcing the plot into certain positions or pruning it like a bonsai tree, rather than letting it grow naturally. And the love triangle between Lancelot, Guinevere, and Arthur never felt completely believable to me, because the story doesn't really explore why the characters develop the love that they do. Christian's tendency to tell rather than show in his writing also weakened my emotional connection to the characters. Nevertheless, I quite enjoyed this duology, particularly the first book, which has a very strong ending and can be read as a standalone. The second book felt a little formulaic to me, as it follows Lancelot's son, Galahad, through a plot that parallels that of the first book. Galahad's development into a knight didn't feel nearly as believable as Lancelot's. Thus, I put these books in the enjoyably rewarding tier. I'll conclude this video with a few of my favorite aspects of the 15 Arthur retellings I've discussed. My favorite version of Arthur, Park Godwin's. My favorite version of Guinevere, a tie between Park Godwin and Giles Christian. My favorite version of Lancelot, Bernard Cornwell's. My favorite version of the central love triangle, Park Godwin's. My favorite version of Merlin, a tie between Mary Stuart and A.A. A. Atanasio. My favorite version of Morgaine, Morgana, Morgaze. A tie between Park Godwin and Marion Zimmer Bradley. And my favorite story of Excalibur, Jack White's. I hope you've enjoyed this video and my previous one about King Arthur, and I hope you enjoy reading some or all of the books I've discussed in them. Thanks for watching.